Hello out there, all of you machinists and aspiring machinists. Welcome back to Studio G. Again, I'm sitting in front of the nine inch precision tool room lathe made by South Bend. And this is a follow up on about five or six other videos that I've done on this machine already. And I'll put a playlist down below or at the end or someplace here so you can watch all of them. And yes, this is the machine that in 1959 or 1960, when I was 16 years old, I was in my dad's class, I used this machine, and this lathe was, was used in part to make my Stuart Model 9 steam engine. So I have a lot of sentimentality toward this, and notice that the school colors were red and green. A slightly different green than this, but maybe that's what inspired the color combinations here, like it or not. All right, let's begin with some other improvements and uh, things that I want to tell you about this machine that haven't been done yet. So let's start. Here's the playlist for the South Bend 9 inch tool room lathe. You may remember me lamenting the fact that there was no chip pan on here. But obviously there originally was because there's a bracket here for it right here, but none here. So I don't have any sheet metal bending equipment anymore, but I found over on the other side of the garage a pan where I have been keeping my grease guns. You know how they drip all the time. And I had made this pan probably 30 or 40 years ago, galvanized, and it's a little bit bent up. I did clean it, but it's still not real great. Uh, like I say, it's got some bends here, but I put another angle iron right here, probably out of your sight. But would you believe that this actually is the right length and it fits with a glove? Like that. And I'm all set and I love it, so it's very easy to dump the chips out. I had great plans to check this tailstock alignment. But, as I said before, this is the huge spindle, and I do not have the correct sleeve to go in there. This one is, again, I showed you a couple that didn't fit the other day, and I found a third one that doesn't fit. But ideally, I need this along with the correct size center, and then I can, with a test bar, check the alignment between the headstock and tailstock centers. That's in other videos. I won't be able to show it to you on this one. I'm in the process of cleaning up the lead screw, and I've already polished a bit the unthreaded portion of the lead screw. There was green paint on here, and it was just kind of tarnished, and I did it in a manner like this with a strip of emery cloth. And that works very well. Again, when you use this, do not wrap it around your fingers. Hold it like I showed you here with the end so it can easily be pulled out of your hands and not hurt your fingers. In a recent video I showed you how to clean the lead screw using string and that was very popular. People were amazed by that but it's, it's really no big deal. So since not everyone watches every video I'm going to repeat that. If you've seen it before just skip through this real quickly. Fortunately, I have a little bit of string left for this, but make sure you use a very lightweight string. We used to call it egg string, you know, that you can break like that. Do not use a shoelace or a piece of parachute cord or, or anything of that nature. So, with the string wrapped around the unthreaded portion here, and again, I will hold it like this. Don't wrap it around. Hold it like this. I know I'm making a big deal out of it, but it, it could potentially be dangerous, so just turn the machine on. I think I'll start from farther down on this end, and of course I can't do the whole lead screw at one time because the carriage is in the way. And see how I'm advancing the string here as it gets dirty. And now a close-up.
Okay, enough of that. And if it's really, really dirty, you could use a little brass brush or a toothbrush to get the initial debris out of the threads. By the way, this is a genuine buck, a just a true chuck. It's very high quality. If you'd like to see me zero one of these out in a video, let me know, although I think I've done that in the past. Well, I wanted to know the RPM. There's six speeds for this machine. Three in uh, direct drive and three in back gears. Now, they also sold this machine, apparently, with a two-speed motor, which would double it to 12 speeds. But I have no information whatsoever on what the speeds are, so I decided to, to check it and write it down. So, and I did it two ways. Can you see the piece of reflective tape right here? So using this cheap little thing, I'm able to determine the speed. However, I don't really like this because it seems like the results are hit and miss. Sometimes it's one number and, and it's hunting, so I'm going back to the genuine uh, tried and true uh, Stuart Warner tachometer, which I love. I'll just take one reading and that is with the pulley or the belt on step three, that's the one farthest this way, and direct drive, so it's the slowest speed in direct drive is what it is. So just putting the rubber tip into a hole, a center hole, you can direct read, and it's right at a little bit under 500, I would say 450, 475. This isn't all that accurate as far as the numbers. It's kind of like a speedometer. Matter of fact, Stuart Warner made speedometers, didn't they? But anyway, the final results are that I and I recorded it on a scrap paper, which I won't show you, but I have 1160 as the high, then 750 and 500, and in back years it's 215, 130, and the very slowest at around 90. Both the compound and the cross slide are very, very tight. And looking down here, you probably can't tell, but it's hardened oil or grease and I, it needs a good cleaning. So I'll start with the compound, taking that off and taking it apart, and I, maybe I won't show all of that, but I've loosened up these two, and off comes the compound, I think. There. So looking on these surfaces, like right here, using a razor blade scraper, and you see all of the debris, it's probably a combination of sawdust and dried oil, so I'm going to get all of that cleaned off right here, it's just terrible. And then probably use a little brush, I'll get a wire brush, and a Scotch-Brite, and I know some people are mad at me for using Scotch-Brite, but it's a pretty effective material. In a previous video, I talked about the compounds, and I said, really, this one, this scrap on here is the same. Well, it's not. It appears to be the same at first glance. By the way, look at the larger collar on this, as opposed to this. So this would be much newer, and I think it's just off of a 9-inch lightweight. But what I wanted to show you is the difference in the, the gibbs. Now, this one uses this type of gib. It's not a tapered gib, and it's in there, and we tighten it and adjust it with these four little screws, and I've done that in many, many videos, but this one is totally different. So both the cross slide and the compound have wedge type of tapered uh, uh, gibs, and they're tightened with a screw here. You can see that's all buggered up, but I'm going to attempt to get that out right now. But that's very similar to the gibbs that you see on a Bridgeport milling machine. And there is a little set screw hole here to lock it in position, but I, I just probed that and there's really nothing in there. So this should just back out with uh, a heavy screwdriver, and I'll do that off camera and be right back, and this one is the same. And also, before I take it out, notice how, how deep the screw is. And looking at the other end, the gib is sticking out, so that means that both the gib 
and the dovetail are probably pretty well worn because originally I would say that that would have been about flush. Okay, it's pretty well apart here, so I'll pull the gib out and the gib screw went in here. So this is what it's doing, it's just moving the, the wedge-shaped gib in and out until it's snug. You know, and this is absolutely as dry as a bone. There is no trace of lubrication in there whatsoever. And then also taking this screw out, that releases the brass nut, which is, if I can hold this tight, look at how wobbly that is. So between the wear in the brass nut and the wear on the screw, it's pretty sloppy, and I demonstrated that in the last video. So what I'm going to do now off camera is I'll get this all cleaned up and oiled and everything and ready to put back on, and then I'll take the cross slide off. Okay, here's all of the parts, and it cleaned up pretty nicely, although there's, it's just badly worn. Missing a, a screw right here. That screw I did take out. That's simply to drop oil onto the screw. That's, that's all that is. And this looks real good. And even the gib cleaned up kind of nicely. And what I had to do with this, I did recut the slot. It was just totally worn. So I'll put it back together off camera. Be right back. Okay, all cleaned up, reassembled, and ready to go. Well, I just about have the cross slide out, but look at the debris on here. Looks like coal tar. That hasn't been a part in a while. But I got the brass nut disconnected, no easy job. And then this will pull out. Needs a good cleaning. And we even got wood shavings down in here, so I'll blow that out or use the vacuum cleaner and just get it immaculate before I put it back together. Okay, it's ready to reassemble. Everything cleaned up pretty nicely. Even the gib looks pretty good. Now if you take a look at this nut, the cross slide nut, close up you're going to see that it also is badly worn, or the screw, or both. And I've blown that all out, so everything's nice and clean, ready to assemble. I'll be back as soon as it's together. There's a tiny little screw here that has to be removed in order to put a drop of oil in. And uh, did you ever notice that the screw that goes in here, that actually attaches the brass nut, <clears throat> has, in fact, a tiny little screw in the center of it, which is also an oiling screw, oil hole, and it goes all the way through the bottom. And also there's a hole in the bottom of the brass nut that allows the oil to get onto the screw. Okay, I'm ready to put the compound on, and first I'll put these two pins in, and the orientation here matters greatly. They have to go in like that, and I'll just push them in a little ways, Everything's pre-oiled and ready to go. Like that, and now I can poke these in. And if they don't go all the way in, that means that you got them uh, <coughs> oriented incorrectly. And then one of these square bolts on each side. Well, it's all back together, and I think it's ready to use. Well, that completes this episode of the South Bend Lane. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. I know I did. I always learn something by working with this machinery. It's just a lot of fun. Get yourself one. <clears throat> Be sure and watch all of the other videos in this series. And I'll put that playlist right here in a moment. So, see you next time. Give me a thumbs up if you think I deserve it. 
So long for now. Here's the playlist for the South Bend 9-inch tool room lathe.